Good afternoon and uh, welcome to CTRL's Faculty Awards Luncheon. Uh, today we celebrate excellence in teaching and I'm really grateful to see uh, so many of you uh, who are able to join us. Now, before I, I begin, I want to extend a special welcome to Ann Farron, the Ann Farron. <laughs> uh, Peter Starr, Dean of College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Nancy Davenport, the librarian. Uh, Laura Bondurant, Senior uh, Dean of Academic Affairs in the School of Communication. Um, who else? Please. And... Okay. And then I also want to actually uh, convey uh, congratulations to the awardees from Provost uh, Dan Myers and also uh, Dean of Academic Affairs Mary Clark, uh, who were unable to join us this afternoon. Um, all right. I also um, I want to congratulate the awardees today, who will be introduced to all of you um, shortly. Uh, today we're going to recognize winners of three awards, the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, Award, the Ann S. Farron Curriculum Design Award, and the Jack Child Teaching with Technology Award. Uh, for each of the awards, I will announce the winners uh, who will be asked to come to the front uh, to, um, to be introduced while I describe the award for which they are being recognized. A flurry of photos will be taken. Uh, thank you, Jeff Watts. Uh, followed by a short presentation by each of the faculty on their work. Okay. So awardees. I will call you, you come up, uh, receive the award, and then present uh, a short uh, work of, uh, that you're being recognized for. The uh, Milton um, and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship uh, of, of Teaching and Learning Award recognizes AU faculty who have contributed to the analyses of teaching practices or of <laughs> curricular design. We are grateful to the Greenberg family for making this award possible. The 2018-2019 winners are uh, Benjamin Stokes, the School of Communication, and Paul Wachner, the School of International Service. Uh, ben and Paul, please come up. I think we can yeah, just stand here for now. Uh, so uh, we recognize Benjamin Stokes for his application of research-based approaches to instruction. His community-embedded curricular innovations are at the intersection of uh, two of American University's strategic priority areas. Um, Metropolitan Studies and Game Design. His classes, in his classes, his students design and develop original games and activities that are embedded within the community, like at bus stops, to provide insights on real world city challenges such as gentrification and race relations. Students benefit not only uh, from um, the excellent experiential learning, but they also get to contribute to Professor Stokes research on how cities are using games to engage its citizens. We recognize Paul Wapner for his work to understand the causes of environmental harm and how the world can build a sustainable future. In doing so, he has developed thoughtful and engaging ways to invite students into his global environmental politics class as a domain of inquiry. In particular, Paul has integrated contemplative practices into the learning process by recognizing that global environmental issues are not simply technical, political, and economic problems, but are also existential challenges. Over the years, he has introduced and written on the benefits of various elements of contemplative uh, practices into the classroom, including meditation, journaling, yoga, personal check-ins, and deep textual studies. Congratulations, uh, Ben and Paul. Um, hello, everyone. So I want to tell you just a little bit about my work, which combines my research with my teaching. In fact, I'm really excited to be at AU because I feel like the value placed on teaching doesn't mean that that's the second piece that we add on, but rather something that can substantially integrate and, in fact, advance research. Um, for me, uh, this hybridity is also of interest around cities. Uh, so our cities are becoming hybrid places. And one way of understanding a hybrid place uh, is that if you exist only in the physical side of the city, you're actually cut off from part of the connection to your neighbors, part of the conversation, and even part of democracy. You increasingly have to be part digital in order to engage in places. 
Uh, and that's especially true in a bunch of American cities. My work, I looked at this often through the angle of games, which are one of the cutting edges for how we understand how the physical and the digital start to come together. Uh, and I think they foreshadow a bunch of things that are happening uh, that will come in terms of governance, um, but they'll also affect a bunch of other social issues in our society and have implications for things like equity and gentrification, which we know are not just based on things like your educational uh, background, but also our perceptions of space and our perceptions of place and our perceptions of community. Uh, and games are a great place to experiment with that. Uh, a tiny uh, note on my research, I was out in San Jose earlier, uh, along with a number of other cities, um, where I was studying Pokemon Go and how cities are taking Pokemon Go, uh, which of course people uh, probably saw, people wandering around city streets um, playing this game, um, but in San Jose, they said, can we turn this to connect our neighbors and uh, introduce people to neighborhoods they haven't otherwise connected to? Um, they uh, had an existing event that already was closing down city streets and bringing people out. When they added the Pokemon Go element, 35,000 more players uh, showed up for that one day event. Um, they also brought in uh, close to half a million dollars uh, more into the local economy just for that uh, one day. And this is some of the research I was doing in Pokemon Go. But I also uh, present a map just to remind us that this uh, one day uh, was also imagined by players quite differently. This is how players annotated the event map with their own version of what the city is from a digital perspective. Um, this is something that I've started to bring into classes uh, with a class that I created called Playful City. Uh, and Playful City is a class that is in our game design program here, uh, which is a joint effort of the College of Arts and Sciences and the School of Communication. And I think it's the bringing together of those different areas that is some of its strength uh, in, in, and lets us do interesting things with the students um, and with our research. Uh, so in this class, the students design things like Pokemon Go uh, for uh, Washington, D.C. and other places. Uh, some of them are mobile phones. That's what we often assume. Uh, th these must be for mobile phones. Well, actually, others involve things like your bus card um, and how that has a, a chip in it, which can be read and used as a token. Um, also, a, a, a student ID can be used in the same way. Um, we also do games that tie into the uh, Internet of Things, so the smart home kind of devices that we have increasingly along with like the Nest thermostat that are appearing in more places um, and lights. Um, to show you a couple pictures of what the class looks like, uh, these are some of the games that our students were testing out on the quad uh, right out here on campus. Uh, and it was pretty fun to watch them wandering around with their laptops, which were wired and, and used for certain aspects of testing the game and designing the game, and then mobile devices. Uh, this was a game that was interested in recycling and having people uh, trace the flow of items across campus, uh, the connections between different buildings and how the university was processing recycling material. Um, the game design process looks something like this. These are some shots from our game design facility. And if you've never visited it, I think it's one of the gems of our campus in terms of the innovation for how research and teaching are connected together. There's a classroom which has a giant door. It almost feels like a, a hobbit kind of door that swings open into a giant design space. And the way those two spaces are paired, I think architecturally represents some of the ways that we're trying to connect uh, the classroom and a design and applied research space. Um, so this is in the design uh, research space mostly, although there's a little bit of classroom uh, uh, pictures there as well. Um, here's one of the games that students created as part of this. Uh, they were using um, Philips uh, Hue uh, and RFID chips. Uh, so this is what I mentioned before, the RFID that are in like your bus card um, can be used to tap in. Uh, and here they were uh, very interested in how light pollution might be something that you could play the game and have actual light as part of the feedback mechanism. So the color of the light represented the health of our environment uh, in terms of the light pollution in the city. Um, and I could go into more of the interesting game design, although you really often with games you have to play them to get, to get it. So I'd come and play some of our games sometimes. Uh, our students are creating some really interesting ones um, all the time. And I think that it also sh it sheds light on what we can do with the city. So there's some really fun partnerships that we've been developing, um, doing some work right now with the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum, um, and, uh, and, and in conversation with a, a number of different city agencies, which are also interested in, in experiments with our students. Um, so that's just a little bit of the work that we're doing in this class. So thank you. Uh, I'm honored to receive this award. I don't have any technology. I don't have a PowerPoint. Maybe I have one powerful point. Um, but, uh, um, and I'm, I'm really honored to see my colleagues. Um, so when I first came to AU, I remember my first day of teaching. And when I got my PhD, no one ever talked about teaching. And so 
I remember my first day of class, I had totally prepared. I had a great lecture, and I had questions, and I went through it, and I finished, and it was great. And I looked up, and there was like an hour left. <laughs> and, and so um, it was amazing of how, of how little, in fact, I, I really received absolutely no instruction about teaching when I was a PhD student. So I'm really um, um, thrilled that uh, this, with this Greenberg Award, and I was a Greenberg Fellow for teaching PhDs earlier in my time here. Um, as Kehoe said, I teach global environmental politics, and this is a pretty dark subject. Um, you know, last week we learned that a million species are going to go extinct, or on the verge of extinction. Uh, and we learned earlier this fall that, um, what, that we have 12 years to basically cut carbon emissions in half, to have a chance of staying below two degrees. Um, so, and I don't even know how to say that anymore. It sounds so abstract, but it's so, it feels so real. Um, and so I teach classes trying to apprentice students into that world. Um, some successfully, some not. My students, one class I used to teach, Global Environmental Politics, that was the title of it. Students renamed it Introduction to Doom because it was sort of like, you know, we'll do climate change, we'll do loss of biological diversity, do toxification, and it just got, it just got really, um, really uh, challenging. And typically the way people teach this is they start with, let's say, freshwater scarcity, they move to biodiversity, they go through these problems, and then the last week they say, and you can make a difference. And we send students off. It's sort of like Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth, where it's sort of during the credits, where it says what you can do. So, um, so as Kehoe said, I've, I've been trying to think about, so how does one teach this differently, not just me, obviously many people have been thinking about this, but the fundamental, I suppose, insight is that these problems aren't just technical, they're not just economic, they're not just political, but they're existential in that sense that they challenge what it means to be a human being right now, um, in this moment, in what ge geographers call the Anthropocene. Um, and uh, we've never been, not we, the, the, our species has never been on a planet where a single species is you know, unintentionally, for sure, but committing ecocide. I mean, we are basically um, wiping out many other life forms. Um, so the question is, how does one teach that profundity? And does that profundity itself act as sort of an activator of learning? And many people feel like it is, that actually it's not just about bumming people out, but it's expanding what that challenge means. and. Um, and just one quick thought, I, I, just, I just remembered this. You know, uh, in social science, when you have problems like this, they're called wicked problems. And if they're really complicated, they're called super wicked problems. <laughs> but our students, I teach freshmen, when they hear wicked, it's like awesome. <laughs> no, seriously. And there's a sense in which wrestling with these problems is a moment, it's sort of like a civilizational challenge in which people become more alive. Um, so, as Kiyo said, what I've been looking at and doing research on is looking at the contribution of contemplative practice to pedagogy. And so, to what degree does um, slowing down the cogitating mind and allowing students to open up to other ways of feeling, of knowing, um, and so forth. And so, I just thought I'd talk about two quick examples of this. Um, so in one of my classes, we talk about the problem of um, uh, we talk about the problem of displacement or environmental justice, the ways in which we move problems from one area to another. We take problems, we send them into the future, so future generations are the victims, but we also fundamentally send them downstream to those who are less fortunate. And so one thing we do, in fact, one of the interesting things, if we ask ourselves, I won't ask you, I'll ask it. Uh, rhetorically, you know, where does our water come from? How many of us know that? Where does our electricity come from? So one thing we do in class is we ask, where does our trash go? Who is it that receives this? And so what we do is we collect our trash for the week, and students are required to literally carry it around with them for the week, so it's not just a personal thing, it's political. They have to talk about it and so forth. <coughs> um, and, 
And then um, in class, they bring it to class. We, we open up the bags. We kind of analyze our lives through, we look at our week through our materiality. Um, and then, um, and then at the, after doing this, we take the trash and we pass it around so people receive something that they didn't produce. And they don't know who produced it. They can kind of figure it out, perhaps. But the contemplative piece here is that then what we do is we sit down and we write a letter to the people on the receiving end. Because we study who's going to get this. What do they look like? What regions do they live in? What class? What, um, what race? And so forth. And they write a letter to somebody um, on the receiving end. And it can be a thank you note. It can be uh, a sort of a recognition of some actions some students want to take. But it's to get that sort of larger piece. Um, and uh, the second example here is that we look at the causes of environmental harm. And, in, in addition to looking at population and affluence and technology and economic interests or the tragedy of the commons, we also focus on um, the kind of part of ourselves that is the kind of cogitating, acquisitive mind that sort of can't sit still and how that translates into material purchasing. And so there we use certain meditation techniques to kind of <coughs> slow down and notice when that itch happens and see if we can kind of understand it um, and come to terms to it and perhaps diffuse it and also recognize how challenging it is to do that and to recognize, therefore, the political dimensions which are involved. The final thing I'll say is that we just had graduation and graduation is a cool metaphor for sort of this contemplative piece because when we see our students up there, they're, they're wearing a robe, they're wearing a cap, and on some level, one could say, so what are we really interested in? We're like interested in the frontal lobe. You know, it's like that's what this is all about. And the question is, can we teach in a way that maybe, you know, opens the robe up a little bit, um, takes the hat off, and so forth. So that's kind of what I've been doing. I've been writing about this and um, teaching workshops. And I feel uh, terrifically honored to um, to receive this award and to continue this work and to have these great jobs where we get to do this stuff. So thank you. Congratulations, Ben and Paul, once again. Um, so the next award is the, the Ann S. Farron Curriculum Design Award. Uh, we are grateful to Ann Farron for making possible this award. Uh, which recognizes the collaborative work of two or more faculty who creatively enable students to integrate their learning over the course of their undergraduate experience. On a side note, please feel free to get up and get coffee or drinks and more food. So we definitely want to have all the food eaten. Um, this year's awardee is a team that comprises a librarian, Rachel Borchardt, and faculty from the Department of Physics, Cindy Finkel, Greg Harry, Nate Harshman, and Jessica Yusinski. Uh, awardees, please make your way to the, the front of the room. Uh, in 2012, Nate invited Rachel Borchardt uh, to introduce students uh, in his new physics capstone seminar uh, to the idea of information literacy. Uh, that invitation revealed uh, a need to more systematically incorporate information literacy concepts throughout the curriculum which then led to the productive collaboration which we celebrate today. Uh, using a comprehensive three-tiered information literacy plan developed by um, librarians at the university library, they got to work. Uh, for instance, Jessica revised Physics 110 as a Habits of Mind course to have a learning outcome focused on scientific information literacy. Cindy worked with Rachel on Physics 331, Modern Physics, uh, typically taken by second year students in physics to introduce information literacy in the field of physics. And Greg's Physics 440 Experimental Physics course, students were given strategies uh, for seeking high quality uh, sources for undergraduate papers that they were required to submit to a physics research journal for undergraduates. And so they were building uh, from year to year. As a result of the collaboration, the physics department has a curriculum that introduces, reinforces, and puts into practice information literacy systematically and comprehensively. Congratulations, Rachel, Cindy, Nate, Greg, and Jessica. <laughs>
right, so I'm here to give you a quick primer on information literacy, woo! Um, and more importantly, how we scaffold those skills through these four courses. Um, so three of the four are taken by majors. The first one is non-majors, but uh, we try and uh, kind of create a seamless transition between them so that we're building from course to course. Um, but a quick overview of information literacy, because I think sometimes there are some misconceptions. Um, what I hope to impress upon you is that what we tend to think of when we think of library instruction and information literacy is the nuts and bolts, the how. How do we search databases? How do we figure out if it's a review article or a primary research article? Um, how do we use those databases? How do we select a database? However, what we are trying to do uh, with W2 and in this integration is to also talk about the why. Um, so to give the students the contextual information to be able to understand why they're putting these skills into practice, right? So why do we care about evaluation? Obviously, fake news has kind of prompted that question a little more uh, in recent years, but why do we have all these different types of information? Why can't Google find it all, right? Why do we pay millions of dollars to access library resources? Why is it important that you use them? Um, and then why is the kind of information that we produce as faculty unique? And how is that changing? Um, and why? So this is all stuff that gets covered in these four courses. So I'm going to do just a brief introduction to the four courses and what we do in those classes. But keep a lookout for these how and why and how we build uh, between those classes. So starting with the natural scientific habits of mind, um, what we're really talking about is evaluation of information from a non-scholarly perspective. So this is the learning outcome that exists for the natural scientific habit of mind courses. Um, and in this one, we really are talking about popular discourse um, and daily life information. So less on the scholarly, uh, more on where is physics information happening in your daily life and how can we give you some skills to evaluate it. So we talk about pumpkin chunkin. <laughs> Uh, which, if you don't know, is like a trebuchet for pumpkins where you try and fling them as far as you can. So we talk about an article that exists, and I'm sorry this is so blurry, uh, but it's in nyup.com, and it's essentially a hype piece about a festival um, dedicated to pumpkin chunkin. Um, I know. <laughs> the students give me the same look when I say that. Um, but in this article, there is a scientific claim made that the, uh, what is it, the angle... Yes, the, sorry, I was going to read it, but it's, it's a little blurry. Designs vary in function, and I can't read it, but uh, essentially saying that the, a higher angle will increase your distance, which is not entirely accurate if you know anything about physics. So what we talk about uh, are three main principles to evaluate this article and the scientific information in this article. We talk about the authority, so who wrote this article, what is nyup.com, what kind of background in science do they have or don't they have in this case? We talk about the transparency of the information. How do they support the claims that are made? Um, in this case, you can see there are some videos that they use as supporting evidence, uh, but they're not citing, say, a physics textbook or anything like that. And finally, what's the purpose? Why is this information created? And it's definitely not in this case for scientific knowledge, right? It's, uh, it's a big advertisement to get you to visit upstate New York. But we talk about all these things. They think it's a little silly, but this is to get them to understand science exists in places, and we can think about how that information is being delivered in a lot of different contexts, and you can bring your physics information to bear as you evaluate that information. So they then do this with another article that they find on their own. Um, so that is the non-majors course. Moving on to 331. Uh, as Kiso, Kiho said, this is really uh, sophomores, one of their first introductions to physics within the major after they take their intro level courses. So this correspondingly is kind of their first introduction to what information looks like within the physics major. So some basic physics specific information that's being delivered by introducing them to the academic environment, in, uh, including how we find materials, uh, how to read academic sources. Um, but also some of the basic evaluation strategies, what is popular, what is scholarship, what is uh, scholarly, and within scholarly, what are the differences between things like a review article and a primary research article, right? So giving them some basic tools to be able to evaluate the kind of information they're being exposed to in an academic context in this course. Then 440, which was just approved as a W2, congratulations. <laughs> um, 
is when they start to, we are building on that basic information and refining it a bit further. So we get a little more specific into different types of scholarly information, including things like conference proceedings, um, right? Some more, some less obvious sources of information. Um, we're starting to talk more about how to find information in a more strategic way. So this is when we talk a little bit more about keyword choice. They're at the, the stage where they've taken enough physics that they can really think about different ways to describe their research topic and have some uh, choice with how they strategically search for information. Additionally, we start to talk about different ways, different places where we can find that information. Physics is really fun in that they have embraced open access to a degree which almost no other discipline has. Um, there's an entire preprint database called archive.org that we introduce them to at this point and talk a little bit about the difference. Um, but not extensively, it's just this is a thing that exists and it is common in physics for people to also use this information resource. And then when we get to the capstone course is when we talk more about why does archive exist? I told Nate requested a cat meme. So this is my cat meme. <laughs> the tie-in here is in capstone. The students are free to pursue any object of inquiry that they choose, including the buttered cat paradox, which is that meme. <laughs> uh, the idea that butter uh, toast will always land butter side down. Cats will always land on your feet. So if you strap them to each other, <laughs> you can create an infinite generator, which is physics. <laughs> if they wanted, I really hope a student does this someday because what we get to talk about in that class is that you're now drawing in different disciplines, animal behavior, right? Um, some other physics topics, um, what are infinite generators? What kind of attempts have been made to create them in the past? Is it possible? Why or why not? Those kinds of things could all be explored in a capstone. So we really need to get more nuanced <laughs> with our information needs um, and where we're finding it. So we talk about uh, more advanced strategies. We talk about even more nuanced categories of information. When would you or how would you use a dissertation? Things like that. Uh, what is the difference between a preprint and what does it mean to be an accepted article versus a published article? Those kinds of topics might come up in capstone. But because of the open access issue, it's also a really wonderful time to talk about what the heck is open access, why does it matter to them, and if they are going, to on, going on to produce scholarship instead of just consume scholarship, how does that inform their choices for where they're going to be publishing and what is their ethical role, essentially, as you guys all know, people who get to choose where you place your manuscript and what it means to support scholarly environments and publication models. Sorry, this is my little political. <laughs> Just slipping that in there. If you ever have questions, the library is here for you. We have an open access fund to help you publish open access. Anyway. <laughs> so those are some of the things that we talk about. We also talk about what are the top journals in your field? How is that decided? Where can you find that? And why is this accurate or inaccurate? Um, so that is our scaffold in less than eight minutes. <laughs> So the next award is the, um, the Jack Child Teaching with Technology Award, named after uh, our founding director. It honors faculty who have demonstrated creativity using technology in their teaching. We have two winners for 2018 and 2019, Michael Alonzo from Environmental Science and Catherine White from History. Would, uh, would Catherine, well, Mike is sick today, so he sends his uh, apologies, but Catherine, would you come to the podium? I will read uh, Mike's uh, description. Um, we recognize Mike Alonzo for his use of drones equipped with thermal cameras and la uh, laser range finders in his environmental science classes. Uh, with drones, students are able to collect their own data on topics such as water use and suburbanization at the Wildland Urban Interface and builds on the basics of field-based global positioning systems and geographic information systems data collection and management using handheld devices. So uh, very, very technical. Uh, these activities allow students to work together and interact in real time while completing analyses using Google tools, including, including Google Earth, Sheets, Docs, and Slides to produce findings that can then be linked to readings and discussions on the fly, literally and figuratively. 
but I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we recognize Catherine White for her use of digital technologies in her course on modern European history. By incorporating technologies including podcasts, media clips, animated shorts, uh, interactive maps, blog posts, assignments, Catherine has made topics from another time and another place accessible and engaging to her students. One of the key assignments uh, on Catherine's syllabus involves the use of online platform thinklink.com which provides user-friendly technology tool to transform images into interactive graphics. Catherine's use of interactive technologies in the classroom advances a number of learning outcomes, including helping students to develop the ability to evaluate evidence and sources to develop an argument that takes into account social and historical contexts or conditions. Congratulations to Mike and Catherine. begin by thanking CTRL and everyone here uh, for honoring me with this award. I also want to thank Max Paul Friedman in the history department who's not here but who nominated me for this board and has been really supportive in this process. Um, so I am an adjunct professor here at American. This is my second year teaching in the history department teaching modern European history. And this course fits within the Habits of the Mind curriculum, and it aims as a general education course to develop ways of thinking about the past that continue to have relevance for understanding the present. Just as a side note, I was talking to the people at my table, and they were like, what is modern European history? So that seems self-explanatory, but actually it's not. Um, modern European history for historians is basically the period from 1789 to present from the French Revolution to present. So we cover a lot of material, a couple centuries worth of material. And so it's finding ways really of making students understand that even ideas from as early as the French Revolution still have significance in our lives. Um, and I would just note on that that we are now exploring all different types of ways in history of thinking about modernity and there are ideas of alternative modernities and perhaps even this course should be rethought through in terms of the topic because Modern European history is one form of many modernities that we understand now. Just in terms of the course, as I mentioned, uh, one of the general education outcomes that we try to achieve is to engage with primary texts to learn to ask questions, debate ideas, come to understand ways that we experience the events and ideas of the past in our own lives. And I have really found that technology is a great way to help us achieve that goal, to help students understand how the past can have continued relevance in their own lives, um, but then also how we can think through the past in different ways using different technology tools. There are a couple different technology tools that I bring into my classroom on almost a daily basis. I love using blog posts. Um, I love using podcasts. Just to give an overview of the way I might use a podcast on the very first day, one of the things I do with my students is play a radio lab podcast on the limitations of the mind, the limits on the mind, what actually we can retain. And I like that activity because it helps students think through, okay, what consciously, what do I want to get out of this course? And what can I get out of it? Because history is oftentimes seen by students as being just a list of names and dates that they have to memorize. And I really don't want this to be a course about memorizing names and dates. So I spend a lot of time telling them what I want them to get out of it and then having them tell me what they want to get out of it. And then hopefully we can meet somewhere in the middle in terms of figuring out exactly, you know, what is the significance of this topic to understanding the present. Um, I also bring in animated shorts and media clips on a regular basis, uh, and I have a more involved di digital imaging assignment that they do in the first th third of the class, and I want to talk about that in a little bit more depth now. So as Keo mentioned, this is a project that uses this platform called ThingLink, and I found this to be of a number of different platforms that I've used in my classrooms to be particularly user-friendly for students. I teach a lot of students. I have something like 100 students between two universities. So I find teaching with this platform is also beneficial for me because I don't have to give them as much one-on-one -on -one support as some of the other platforms I've brought into my classroom. Um, but I also really like it because it's a way for them to have an assignment that both has them engage with 
primary source documents that we're talking about in class and then also create this more or develop this more creative platform for thinking about those sources in a really different way. So one of the things that they're expected to do is choose between three sets of primary source documents that we've discussed up until that point. Primary source documents, just as a reminder, are documents from the historical period in question. Um, they can be written by an individual, they can be an image, they can be a lot of different things that would represent something about that time period. So I have three sets of documents that are really important to some of the key ideas that they've learned in the first unit of the course, uh, or first two units of the course. One is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, Declaration of Rights of Woman and Citizen, and the Haitian Constitution. Um, those three, they can choose which ones they want to compare, and they can also decide in what ways they think that those specific documents speak to one another. Uh, then they have Marx versus uh, Smith, and then they have a couple of sources on the practice of widow burning uh, in the British Empire. All really intense, big topics. And what I want them to do is think back on some of the ways in which we've talked about them and take apart these primary source documents in a short two-page written paper and analyze their significance uh, in terms of how they're in conversation with one another, how they compare, uh, how we should understand them by developing out an original argument. They then use this thing link platform to assess ways in which they might take an image from the present and analyze how the topics, how the ideas that they've discussed in that huge page, page paper continue to have relevance in the world we live in now. And so just to give an example, I think it's probably much easier than me trying to explain it. Um, I had a student who wrote, oh, this isn't actually great, because you can't see the image. Mm -hmm. No, you still can't see it. Well, so they wrote this paper about the, I'm just going to take this out because I can't see anything on the screen right now. Um, <laughs> they wrote this paper about the, let's see if this works now, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Haitian Constitution. And you still can't see it. <laughs> uh, in this paper, they compared how this document about the French Revolution and rights that were specific to white men um, compared with the Haitian Constitution, which was issued just a couple years after that when Haiti declared its independence from France and contained some of the same ideas, but was really about providing rights to a very different population of people in what was the former French Empire to black Haitians and was specific to that and to the rights of former slaves, to the land, to um, property in Haiti. And so I, the student compared the two and then chose this image, which is of a protest. You can't actually see the protest banner, um, but it's a protest that took place recently in France that supported minority rights in France. So they then added what are digital annotations that you can't see here and they explained how different parts of this image reflect back to the ideas that they had discussed in terms of the demand for rights by the Haitian population uh, during the time of the French Revolution. <laughs> Other things students have done are you know, factory floors and explaining how Marx versus Smith talked about the um, estrangement of labor versus the process of supply and demand in a factory floor or how the women's rights movement today, or recently the women's rights movement and the Me Too movement reflects ideas like the Declaration of Man's Rights of Man versus the Declaration of the Rights of Women. So you have more information about this assignment and a sheet I handed out that explains some of the outcomes. Um, but yeah, thanks again, and I appreciate you. Feel free to mingle afterwards. So, so um, 
Thank you all for coming. I want to close this event with a congratulation uh, to the awardees and, a, and a, a heartfelt thank you for all, all of you for coming this afternoon uh, to support your colleagues and to celebrate excellence in teaching. And with that, you may now officially begin your summer. Yeah. <laughs>